good afternoon. We're here in the merit memory of Mary Pearl Trey. We went home to meet her Lord just days ago. So we welcome you, son, granddaughter, and any friends and family who may be touched especially by this loss, by this work, of whom we'll hear more about later, but for whom you have many beautiful memories. And we're here to share that with you, and we appreciate your sharing that time with us today. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who are laboring and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall never perish. Let us turn to prayer. Gracious and loving God, you have made us each one so singular that no one can be a replacement for any of us, nor we for anyone we know. We thank you that in each of us you have placed your mark of creativity and love and possibilities beyond what we think we now know. We come to you for strength peace at this time and for remembrance of this dear one who is now at home with you. Give strength to her son and granddaughter and all those who care and who are part of this service today in one way or the other. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. The Psalms 150 of them, which we will not read all of this time. However, give us strength at this time. These early verses of the 90th Psalm are meant also for you. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare before me a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Some words on behalf of your love. Hello, uh, I'm Ben Reeves. Uh, I will say some words about my mother. She was born Mary Craig Carr, and uh, her name at death was Mary Carr Reeves. Um, sometimes I can tell for a long time, so if you're watching the video, <laughs> you can skip ahead the boring parts if you like. I've been going through her personal effects, of course, now. She died on October 9th. And um, a lot of photos, a lot of artifacts, and 
I can see the whole, all of the stages of her life, including those before I was around. When she was a child, she moved a lot. Her father was in the Navy and she moved from coast to coast. She'd be on the West Coast, she'd be on the East Coast. Um, she often thought of Long Beach and Pasadena as home because that's where uh, she spent the most time. Uh, so she didn't have very many friends outside of the family, uh, except her brother until about age 10. Uh, so she played with the dolls and later on in high school she adopted a cat named Timothy uh, in Pasadena at 1295 San Pasquale, which is part of the Caltech campus right now. She then went to college at Mills College in Oakland. She joined the fencing club and there she started to make her friends, you know, at college. Saw a lot of pictures of friends doing various crazy things in San Francisco together, some fencing things. She had long legs and a relatively short torso, which is good for fencing, so she was chosen for the team. Then she transferred to Berkeley, right next to Mills, and looks like she got a lot more serious about her studying. At a Halloween party, she met a man uh, whose name was Gibson, and they were boyfriend and girlfriend for a while, until suddenly he stopped communicating with her. For some reason, she didn't know. Um, so she got serious about her study. She got a second master's degree, library science. She moved back to Pasadena with her parents, started working as a reference librarian at UCLA, driving across Hollywood. She didn't like Hollywood Boulevard, always wanted to take Fountain Street. Um, out of the blue, this guy calls her back. During that time, he'd graduated, finished his PhD. He'd been living up on a mountain for a while doing his PhD work. He didn't want any distraction from women. But then he calls her up and says, oh, let's date again. Within a few months, they got married in the house in uh, Pasadena here. And um, not long after that, she got pregnant and something came out. That was me. <laughs> She was a wonderful mother. She stopped working. She was pretty much in the background. Uh, she was very supportive. We had a lot of, I have really a lot of nice memories there. Um, birthday parties, you know, she always entertained my friends. We had a big backyard, little house, big backyard. It was in Baldwin Hills, if you know where that area is, but not in the hills, in the flat area. And uh, in 1970, mm, a lot of Los Angeles became very, uh, the crime rate went way up. It went up in Baldwin Hills too, pretty badly, right where we were. We were on the borderline between a good area and, and, uh, and an area where there were drugs everywhere. And uh, it got to the point where the police were scared to come in, so we were somewhat forced to move out to the suburbs, we went out to Palos Verdes, which is south of here. Um, that just about bankrupted us. The, the move, the down payment on the house was all our savings, that was it. We had a, ver a time of very high stress in the family at that time, and she went into a depression where she would just be sleeping all day and all night in the back bedroom. It, it was very sad to watch. After a couple of years, she just snapped right out of it. Just one day, snapped. Didn't know what happened then. Then she started studying other languages. She studied Latin. We went to the uh, symphony. She often brought me to the symphony rehearsals. I really enjoyed those because it's informal. You don't have to dress up. And I did my math homework in the back while she just, you know, quietly listened and enjoyed the music. Then I went off to college, so she had the empty nest for a while. I didn't have any brothers and sisters, so um, she mainly hosted my father's students. He was teaching at USC, so I had a lot of students come over, a lot of friends. Then I, uh, after graduation, worked here for a, couple of, for a few years, and I moved to Japan, uh, where my daughter was born, and then she uh, came over to Japan to visit us sometimes, and we sometimes came over here to visit. But they weren't very long visits. But she did learn Japanese long enough to get there. I remember on her first visit to Japan, just after Grace was born, 
you know, she was looking forward to see her granddaughter and this huge typhoon comes through. It was just terrible. She couldn't go outside at all, just for a day. But she was stuck in a hotel where she basically spent her time learning the language and she picked it up quickly. It was uh, pretty interesting. And uh, after this uh, time, um, I went through a difficult time in Japan. I went through a divorce, which was, uh, which was uh, very difficult on all of us. But you know, my mother had a lot of ideas, a lot of practical ideas to cheer me up, and it worked. Not just words. Why don't you try this? Why don't you go to a hotel for a change of scenery? Why don't you move to an apartment? And you know, you know she'd always been in the background before, but that's the first time I realized She's had a lot of experience with depression, loneliness. She knew how to handle this stuff. And it worked. I wound up getting a job and moving back to the US. Um, then working up in Silicon Valley, and you know what work is like there. <laughs> it takes a lot of time. Gradually, my father's health was declining, so she took care of him. And uh, when he died in 2005, she had always wanted to go to Scotland, so um, she did. She and a friend and I went to Scotland for, oh, I think, about two weeks we were there. And she enjoyed that. It was, uh, you know, after taking care of my father, it was, you know, that was such a, that was a depressing time. But, you know, then she goes back home and she's alone and she just starts eating out. Her social life was pretty much eating at these various restaurants and watching the television. And, you know, after some years of that, you can see it's not going too well. The house is deteriorating. And at one point, the house got overrun by mice, which I thought was interesting because she always had cats at home. So I guess maybe the fact that she didn't have any cats anymore, the mice thought it was their place to take over, so they did. And uh, it got pretty bad. We saw a lot of the little gifts that the, mouse, the mice left. It was bad, so we called an exterminator. And the exterminator said, you know, we're gonna work on these guys, but you gotta move out for a couple of weeks. And fortunately, somebody told us that there was a uh, senior, senior assisted living place that was doing month by month stays. And you know, normally they don't do that. Normally they require a big upfront payment and a long-term contract. But this one would do a month by month. So I had her stay there. Now, of course, until this time she was saying, I'm not going to one of those places. Nah, no, not for me, I don't do that. Well, she went in there and after a couple of weeks and she, she told everybody that it's temporary, it's temporary. I'm not here permanently. No, no, I'm not like you people. No, 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 I, I'm, I'm, I'm temporarily here. After a couple of weeks, she told me, this reminds me of my dormitory, I kind of like it. We got me meal times, I got my room, somebody else cleans up my room, um, I don't have to fix my own stuff, I can get cookies in the middle of the night if I want to, <laughs> and she kind of liked it. Well, of course, this thing is month by month, and they hadn't really finished clearing out the mice. So after the first month, she said, I don't think I want to go back to the house, I like this place. So, but I could see, I had a little GPS on her car and she was driving up to the house to just look at it. She wanted to make sure it's there. She had this very strong attachment to home. And um, then we made the longer term contract and then she continued living in the assisted living place and then eventually moved her up here. And, you know, I mentioned that depression that she had back in the 70s and you know, as she got older, she started revealing stuff more and more to me. She really never talked about religious stuff at all, almost never. But she did say one thing about that. How, did she, how is it that you snapped out of that depression? Just one day you had been in that depression, the next day you were fine. She said, I prayed. And <laughs> after decades of living with her, she said, yes, but I don't talk about it because you know, if I ever talk about the religious stuff, you know, the university professors come over and they want to make these philosophical arguments and they give me their abstract thoughts and uh, I don't want to talk about it. And it gets politicized and people put me in a little box. But she had a very strong faith. She really did. She just didn't talk about it. She lived it. And I wanted to say that here because she didn't want to talk about that. She lived it, but she didn't talk about it. And you know, I look back, you know, 
Hmm, how, was that manifesting itself anywhere in her life? And I do remember often we'd go to the PV Symphony, and I was a teenager, and I was you know fidgeting, and I wasn't really paying attention to the music. I was, you know, if I had had a phone, I probably would have been staring at it all the time. But instead, I was doing some puzzle or something. And I remember she kept saying, you know, you can do that, but just don't talk. Be quiet and enjoy it. Be quiet and enjoy it. And I think that's how she lived her life. Just. Let's not make a lot of noise. Let's just enjoy it. And in her final days, you know, she didn't... It's hard to know how much pain she felt. She kept saying she didn't feel pain, although the last few days I, uh, she did say. But, um, yeah, she just kind of, just like her mother, she just kind of slowed down. It was just a long, long slowing down, kind of like the, the toy that's going around and just winds down. And, uh, yeah, in September, you could see it suddenly got worse. Um, actually, a few years ago, her, her heart rate had dropped by half, and then she got a pacemaker in, and it went up to the normal rate. But she was just like her mother, um, just slowing down. Maybe that's how it'll go, too, but she was ready to go at the time. She really, she really, you know, you know, she wasn't eating. They would feed her. She would put the food back out. She just, she was just tired. She wanted to go. She wanted to go. And it was very, very hard seeing her really miserable for the last few days. Uh, that was hard. Now she's in a more peaceful place, so, you know. Um, I guess the way to describe it is a kind of a relief. Maybe? Yeah, it was, it was hard to watch. But. But yeah, she, uh, she gave me a good childhood, many wonderful memories, and I miss her. She's the last link to that part of my life. So, yep, that's, that's my mom. Yeah, that's what I have. Grace, you have anything? Or is that? No, no, okay.
sharing of those memories of your mother, your grandmother, Mary Craig Kerr. Some of the places she was around are familiar to some of us. All the hills, USC, that's the big areas. Much of that area I grew up in. I'd like to leave you with maybe two thoughts from the Gospel of John. The first one is in the 11th chapter of that Gospel, and it's only two words, this verse. Jesus wept. He was going to the home of his friend Lazarus. He loved Lazarus. Lazarus loved him. They were like brothers. As he was on his way, he was told by Lazarus' sister, well, he's already died, and Jesus wept. Sometimes we think that uh, who's ever somehow trying to picture who God is, like Jesus was, we call it an infinity, an infleshing of God was in him. We think they're sort of hard-hearted and aloof and away. They don't really care about how people feel. Jesus wept. And they said, some of the bystanders, see how he loved him. In fact, some people think he was what they called him later in the New Testament, the beloved disciple. But at any anyway, rate, doesn't this sort of infer that somehow that the God that we may see in Jesus is a God who knows where we live? Knows what goes on inside and cares, not some aloof being out there somewhere, but some who came and experienced what we experience and do experience in all kinds of ways. Sort of expressing the way God loved the world so much. And so we sent the one who weeps that we might know God has a heart. Perhaps the greatest academic mind among Christian theologians, those who study about God, last century was a Swiss man named Bart, B A R T H. Many volumes written by this brilliant academic. One day in his class, it said in Switzerland, Professor Barr, what's the greatest thought you've ever had? Can imagine being asked that. What's the greatest thought you've ever had? And he responded with that line that children sometimes sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Jesus wept. Somehow we know that God's heart includes us in it, wherever we are. And that's why there's another verse that said, Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. We live in a world of so much death, natural and unnatural. But the one who created this world and loves it wants people to live, both before what we call death and after. If anyone else would say this, because I live, you shall live also. It's But it's this one who said, 
because I did mutual of also. Somehow his words still ring true. And it's meant for us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Merciful God, we have assembled here, as you well know, in memory of Mary Craig Kerr. And thank you for her life that has affected so many. A life that those of us who didn't have a chance to meet her regret that we didn't get to as well. But now receive her into your presence. For her, pain is no longer, and death is no longer. And we hear the words of Jesus come, be received in the house of my Father, who so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Pray in the name of him who loved us and gave himself who is with us even today, as the one who whom it was said, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of God's Spirit be with you. With us all. Now, for a reward. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.